Hi friends, we are back and today we are watching the video Dr. Sashi Tharoor MP Britain does owe reparations So a video that a lot of you suggested for us to watch and we are here to watch it So without wasting any more time, let's just jump into it venerable and other magnificent institution, I was going to assure you that I belong to the Henry VIII School of Public Speaking, that as Henry VIII said to his wives, I shall not keep you long. <laughs> but now finding myself, but now finding myself the seventh speaker out of eight in what must already seem a rather long evening to you, I rather feel like Henry VIII's last wife. <laughs> I more or less know what's expected of me, but I'm not sure how to do it any differently. Oh. <laughs> now, perhaps what I should do is really try and pay attention to the arguments that were advanced by the opposition today. We had, for example, Sir Richard Ottaway suggesting, they're challenging the very idea that it could be argued that the economic situation of the colonies was actually worsened by the experience of British colonialism. Well, I stand to offer you the Indian example, Sir Richard. India's share of the world economy when Britain arrived on its shores was 23%. By the time the British left, it was down to below 4%. Why? Simply because India had been governed for the benefit of Britain. Mm -hmm. In Britain's rise for 200 years was financed by its depredations in India. In fact, Britain's industrial revolution was actually premised upon the deindustrialization of India. The handloom weavers, for example, famed across the world, whose products were exported around the world, Britain came right in. There were actually these weavers making fine muslin, light as woven air, it was said. And Britain yeah. came right in, smashed their thumbs, broke their looms, imposed tariffs and duties on their cloth and products, and started, of course, uh, taking the raw materials from India and shipping back manufactured cloth, flooding the world's markets with what became the products of the dark and satanic mills of Victorian England. That uh, meant that the weavers in India became beggars and India went from being a world famous exporter of finished cloth into an importer. Went from having 27% of world trade to, to less than 2%. Meanwhile, colonialists like Robert Clive bought their rotten boroughs in England on the proceeds of their loot in India while taking the Hindi word loot into their dictionaries as Whoa. well as their habits. Uh, <laughs> Very good. And the British had the gall to call him Clive of India, as if he belonged to the country, when all he really did was to ensure that much of the country belonged to him. Mm. By the end of the 19th century, the fact is that India was already Britain's biggest cash cow, yeah. the world's biggest purchaser of British goods and exports, and the source of highly paid employment for British civil servants. We literally paid for our own oppression. And as has been pointed out, the wealthy Victorian British families that made their money out of, out of the slave economy, one-fifth of, 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 the, of the elites of, of the wealthy class in Britain in the 19th century owed their money to transporting three million Africans across the waters. And in fact, in 1833, when slavery was abolished, what happened was that a compensation of 20 million pounds was paid not as reparations to those who had lost their lives or, or who had suffered or been oppressed by slavery, but to those who had lost their property. I was struck yes. by the fact that your Wi-Fi password in this union commemorates the name of Mr. Gladstone, the great liberal hero. Well, I'm sorry, his family was one of those who benefited oh from the discussion. Staying with India, between 15 and 29 million Indians died of starvation in British induced famines. The most famous example, of course, was the Great Bengal Famine during the Second World War, when four million people died because Winston Churchill deliberately, as a matter of written militant policy, proceeded to divert essential supplies from civilians in Bengal 
to sturdy Tommies and Europeans uh, as reserve stockpiles. He said that the starvation of anyway underfed, underfed Bengalis mattered much less than that of sturdy Greeks. This is Churchill's actual quote. And when conscious stricken British officials wrote to him, pointing out that people were dying because of this, of this decision, he peevishly wrote in the margins of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? So oh all God. notions that the British were trying to do their colonial enterprise out of enlightened despotism to try and bring the benefits of, of colonialism and civilization to the benighted heathen. I'm sorry, Churchill's conduct in 43 simply one example of many that gave a lie to this myth. As others have said on the proposition, violence and racism were the reality of the colonial experience. And no wonder that the sun never sat, set on the British Empire because even God couldn't trust the English in the dark. Mm. <laughs> very well said. Let me take World War I as a, as a very concrete example since the first speaker, Mr. Lee, suggested these things couldn't be quantified. Well, let me quantify World War I for you. Again, I'm sorry, from an Indian perspective, others have spoken of other countries. One sixth of all the British forces that fought in the war were Indian. 54,000 Indians actually lost their lives in that war. 65,000 were wounded, another 4,000 remained missing or in prison. Indian taxpayers had to cough up 100 million pounds in that time's money. India supplied 70 million rounds of ammunition, 600,000 rifles and machine guns, 42 million garments were stitched and sent out of India, and 1.3 million Indian personnel served in this war. I know all this because, of course, the, the, the commemoration of the centenary has just taken place. But not just that, India had to supply 173,000 animals, 370 million tons of supplies, and in well the well end, well. Hmm. the total value of everything that was taken out of India. India and India, by the way, suffering from recession at that time and poverty and hunger was, in today's money, eight billion pounds. Ooh. You want quantification? It's available. Second World War, it was even worse, two and a half million Indians in uniform. I won't believe the point, but of Britain's total war debt of three billion pounds, in 1945 money, 1.25 billion was owed to India and never actually paid. Somebody mentioned Scotland. Well, the fact is that colonialism actually cemented your union with Scotland. You know, the Scots had actually tried to send colonies out uh, before 1707. They'd all failed, I'm sorry to say. But then, of course, came union and India was available and there you had a disproportionate employment of Scots, I'm sorry Mr. Mackenzie has to speak after me, <laughs> engaged in this colonial enterprise as soldiers, as merchants, as agents, as employees, and the earnings from India is what brought prosperity to Scotland, even pulled, pulled Scotland out of poverty. Now that India is no longer course. there, no wonder the bonds are loosening. Mm. Now we've heard other arguments on this side. There's been a, a mention of the railways. Well, let me tell you, first of all, as my colleague, the Jamaican High Commission has pointed out, uh, railways and roads were really built to serve British interests and not those of the local people. Mm -hmm. But I might add that many countries have built railways and roads without having had to be colonized in order to do so. Uh, they... Yeah. Yeah. they were designed to carry raw materials from the hinterland into the ports to be shipped to Britain. And the fact is that the Indian or Jamaican or other colonial public, their needs were incidental. Transportation, there was no attempt made to match supply to demand for mass transport, none whatsoever. Instead, in fact, the Indian railways were built with massive incentives offered by Britain to British investors, guaranteed out of Indian taxes paid by Indians, with the result that you actually had one mile of Indian railway costing twice what it cost to build the same mile in Canada or Australia because there was so much money being paid in extravagant returns. Britain made all the profits, controlled the technology, supplied all the equipment, and absolutely all these benefits came as private enterprise, British private enterprise, at public risk, Indian public risk. That was the, the, the railways as an accomplishment. We're hearing about aid. I think it was, uh, it was, it was again, Sir Richard Ottawa mentioned 
uh, British aid to India. Well, let me just point out that British aid to India is about 0.4% of India's GDP. The government of India actually spends more on fertilizer subsidies, which might be an appropriate metaphor for that argument. Good. Insulted. But I may point out as well. If I may point out as well that um, that as my fellow speakers from the proposition have pointed out, there have been incidents of racial violence, of loot, of massacres, of bloodshed, of transportation, in India's case, even of one of our, our last Mughal emperor. Yes, maybe today's Britons are not responsible for some of these depredations, but the same speakers have pointed with pride to their foreign aid. You're not responsible for the people starving in Somalia, but to give them aid. Surely the principle of reparations for what is for the wrongs that have been done cannot be denied. It's been pointed out, for example, the dehumanization of Africans in the Caribbean, the massive psychological damage that has been done, the undermining of social traditions, of property rights, of, of the authority structures of these societies, all in the interests of, of, of British colonialism. And the fact remains that many of today's problems in these countries, including the persistence, in some cases, the creation of racial and ethnic and religious tensions, were the direct result of the colonial experience. So there is a moral debt that needs to be paid. Someone challenged uh, reparations elsewhere. Well, I'm sorry, Germany doesn't just give reparations to Israel. It also gave reparations to Poland. Perhaps some of the speakers here are too young to remember the dramatic picture of Chancellor Woody Brandt on his knees in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1970. And there are other examples. There is uh, Italy's reparations to Libya. There's Japan's to Korea. Even Britain has paid reparations to the New Zealand Maoris. So it's not as if this is something unprecedented or unheard of that's going to somehow open some sort of nasty Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. No wonder Professor Lewis reminded us that he's from Texas. There's a wonderful expression in Texas that summarizes the arguments of the opposition, all hat and no cattle. <laughs> now, if I can just quickly look through the other the notes I was scribbling while they were speaking. There was reference to democracy and rule of law. Let me say with the greatest possible respect, you can, it's a bit rich to oppress, enslave, kill, torture, maim people for 200 years and then celebrate the fact that they're democratic at the end of it. Yeah. The, They're just clever like a fox. We were denied democracy, sir. We had to snatch it, seize it from you. With the greatest reluctance, it was conceded in India's case after 150 years of British rule, and that too with a limited franchise. Yes, indeed, ma'am. The author spoke about highly of Greek and Athenian democracy on which the West had prided itself, and spoke of liberty and equality in that same name. The Athenian democracy was only functioning because of the slave society on which it was built. That's the nature of colonization. All right, I don't think that needs, uh, needs contradiction, not for me at any rate. <laughs> <laughs> but but if, I, if, I may just, if I may just point out, I think the argument made by a couple of the speakers, the first speaker, Mr. Lee in particular, conceded all the evil atrocities of colonialism, but essentially suggested that reparations won't really help, they won't help the right people, they'll be used as a propaganda tool, they'll embolden people like Mr. Mugabe. It's always nice how in the old days, you know, uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, the, the people of the Caribbean used to frighten their children into behaving and sleeping by saying Sir Francis Drake would come after them. That was a legacy of that. Of that. Now, that now it's Mugabe will be there. So this is the, the new sort of Sir Francis Drake of our times. The fact is, the fact is very simply, sir, that we are not talking about reparations as a tool to empower anybody. They're a tool for you to atone good. for the wrongs that have been done. Yeah. And I... Very good. I am quite prepared to accept the proposition that you can't evaluate, put a, put a, a monetary sum on the kinds of horrors people have suffered. Certainly no amount of money can expiate the loss of a loved one, as, as somebody pointed out there. Uh, you're not going to be able to figure out an exact amount. But the principle is what matters. The fact is that to speak lightly of sacrifices on both sides, uh, as a, an analogy was used here, a burglar comes into your house, ransacks the place, stubs his toe, and you say, well, he, there was a sacrifice on both sides. <laughs> wow. That, I'm sorry to say, is not an acceptable, is not an acceptable argument. Um, the truth is that um, 
we are not arguing specifically that vast sums of money need to be paid. The proposition before this House is the principle of owing reparations, yes. not the fine points of how much is owed, yeah. to whom it should be paid. The question is, is there a debt? Does Britain owe yes, reparations? Yes. As far as I'm concerned, the ability to acknowledge a wrong that has been done, to simply say sorry, yes. will go a far, far, far longer way than some percentage of GDP in, yeah. in, in, form, in the form of, of, of aid. What is required, it seems to me, is accepting the principle that reparations are owed. Personally, I'd be quite happy if it was one pound a year for the next 200 years yes. after the last 200 yes. years of Britain and India. Yes. Thank you very much, Madam President. Oh, wow. This is fantastic. Very awesome. Beautiful, guys. Very well said. I mean, this man, he, I mean, uh, what is that word? I can't, I don't know how to translate it. But in Hindi, we say, na, bolti band kar di. As he said, we are not, we don't want your money. At least say sorry, apologize for what you've done. You know, go ahead and agree. Yes, what you did was wrong. We all know what you did. We all know how much, how much poverty you bought, how much torture you did to the Indians. I mean, we are still, we are still struggling with that. But this man, oh my God. And he was so well-spoken. The English, yeah. fantastic. The words that he used the phrases in between he brought humor so amazing guys yeah. amazing yeah so i mean he was born in uk uh, i believe but when you listen to this uh, speech i think the first emotion comes as probably some kind of anger yeah mm -hmm. you know uh, he said that before british came india had like 24 percent of the world's GDP and after around 200 years when they left India had 3% of GDP so in other words he is quantifying giving you the numbers to prove that British did bankrupt India okay he also says that the people that spoke before him they did say that yeah we kind of did these things but we are not the ones who did it our ancestors did it right so britons of today didn't do it people before us did it and and i don't and we don't know how much to you know compensate you mm. and that is what he said you know it's not about how much right what you were thinking of giving is 0 0.04 percent of the gdp so that is meaningless the point was saying sorry and agreeing that okay i'm sorry and i will pay symbolic to you now there are a couple of things we need to see right now India is 13 times bigger than UK right 13 times bigger our population 1.3 billion there's 60 million which is like 20 times less okay oh. that is one thing now looking at the GDP that, that they're talking about we are looking at GDP PPP purchasing power parity because that is the right number to compare countries India's GDP is third so first is China US and India is third and there is ninth so 200 years they bankrupt you hmm. after that India gains independence and in this you know 50 60 years now India has more GDP than them Good. right we are third they are ninth in Very GDP good. So what will you give us? We already have more GDP than you, right? Purchase with power parity because that is the right way to do things. Nominal GDP is not a good way to measure. You need to do it PPP. So China is number one, then comes US, third is India, right? That is one thing. Now in just span of 60 years, India is more stronger in military, convention military. You look at army, you look at air force, you look at navy. India is many, many times bigger and stronger than UK, right? The only thing where UK probably is better is nuclear warheads. So they probably have more nuclear warheads, but India is trying to catch up. I don't even know if India believes in nuclear weapons, but the point is that's the only thing where they're ahead in nuclear warhead. But conventional, they're nowhere compared to India, okay? 
now the other thing that I wanted to say was primarily that their defense budget, right? If you go back in history, you look at how much money India spends on. So you will see if you go during the year, slowly, slowly, India is increasing the budget for its military. Now it is more than UK's. Good. Right? Yeah. So now it is until a couple of years ago, they were keeping coming closer. But now if you look at now, they slightly more than UK. So now we spend more on budget than they can because they cannot do more. Their, their GDP is so less. They are producing very less. Right? But India is, I said, 13 times bigger, 20 times more populous country is going to go up like up, right? So if India is going to go up, it will be easy for India to spend few percent of the GDP. That will be maybe, you know, two or three times their budget. So obviously, now the other thing that you see is that in UK, I mean, uh, India is the third largest investor in UK. Mm -hmm. So India is the third and UK is probably the 18th large largest investor in India. So they are very low when you compare it to India. Let's look at which countries are investing. They are 18th. Not a big deal. We have so many countries. You know, and when you look at them, who is investing in your country? India is third. So there's a lot of now dependence on them. Now, I mean, he said, the MP said very good things about how they bankrupted India. What did they do? They took all the raw materials from here shipped the raw materials to UK, they, UK people took the raw material, their industry started working, they made finished product and then they asked Indians to buy. They forced them. Huh, they, yeah. they, if you need something, you buy from us. Yeah. Because they're so, not letting them right. make it. So they took your raw material, they manufactured products, sold it back to you. Right. Now he said about the trains, the goal of the trains was to pick up the raw material, take it to the ports and ship it out. They didn't care about demand and supplies. Yeah. What was he trying to say? It was, Look at the places, there's a lot of population. Look at the places where people desperately need transportation. Did you build railways looking at the amount of people that desperately needed? No, you did where the raw materials were, right? So they had, they had really put a lot of energy into bankrupting India, mm. into just destroying. Now, he said the Winston Churchill, the way he said, you know, he knew that people were in really bad condition in West Bengal, but he said, no, forget it. We are not going to give them money. And then he's, and look at the racism that he points out that when is Mahatma Gandhi going to die? Yeah. So he is showing you facts of racism, written facts. It's written in the margin. He has read it. And he is talking about Winston Churchill saying that, hey, the people of West Bengal already are getting very less food. They're almost going to die. So why save them? Have the Greeks. Right. And then he talks about the contribution of India in World War One, World War Two. I mean, we are not fighting as India at the time. Mm, yeah. Right. We are fighting on the behalf of British. So they really use their mastermind to use India, bankrupt India, destroy India. And now after 50 years, as I said, India is coming back, putting more in defense than them, can beat them in a conventional war. In nuclear weapons, we have enough to beat anyone on Earth. And then... GDP, we are third, they are ninth. They have already been beaten with respect to GDP. India produces so much, right? So obviously, 13 times smaller, 20 times less population. India will really beat them. Cool. Now, my hope in life is that in a couple of years, when India moves faster, get the Kohinoor back. Oh, yes. Right? Yeah. Now, yeah. now India, when India tried just now, that didn't work because India is not such a big compared to them but big even power, right? big power yeah. wait for 10 years in 10 years India will be so big then it will say boss give the Kohinoor back and they'll be forced to give Kohinoor or mass layoffs all the investment yeah. that's how India has to play and say mass investment I'm the at the time probably the largest investor in your country mm. we are going to pull back the investment you guys are going to have a real big problem so give back the loot that you took from us right we are not asking we are not asking you to give something. What you took from us, give it back. back yeah. And that will be the day that I hope one day I witness where the stuff comes yeah, back. We are alive to watch and, it. And number two, now, now I'll tell you one more article. There was another uh, documentary on Jallianwala Bagh made by somebody in UK. Mm, yeah, right? Yeah. Now that gentleman goes to the granddaughter of General Dyer. Mm. Right? She, he goes over there and says, and talks about them and says, are you sorry? 
for what your grandfather did I and, he, to, and he told yeah. all the story he all the all facts the all the facts all the proofs right. and then he went and said so are you sorry after listening to all this and she did not say sorry oh my god she kept on saying no i mean he was trying to help his he and in her mind she was not willing to say sorry for janya wala bag yeah. and that guy pressed her but no no okay now fast so 10 years right they will fast so 10 years and then he look at the amount of influence india will have then kohinoor will come back they will agree to wrong doings that they did and eventually i mean i hoping that one day i see that but this uh, video is fantastic it opens the eyes and obviously teaches one thing as i said in previous videos also do not let somebody conquer you yeah you know i mean earlier you got conquered because number one india was a peaceful country and it could not think that people are going to you know attack you and they had superior weapons so history must not repeat india never attacks any country first yeah but you need to be so strong that nobody can ever think on attacking you right and that is what the history has taught but very good uh message that he gave in beautiful english yeah. and very nicely i think he has represented india fantastic job so but anyhow i mean the point is that i've made my statements and i hope uh, i i hope to see the day when uh, you know we see the reversal of colonization yes guys oh and if you're new to my channel don't forget to hit that subscribe button and hit the bell icon so it notifies you when i put in my new video for you to enjoy bye